first line here. Then you find somebody after that. Uh, no, I, I have a special one for you, the book of Daniel. That's it. I'm done. Four great beasts were among them, coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had wings of an eagle. It kept looking until its wings were plucked. It kept looking until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. Well, that's where evolution came from, because now it stood up, given to it. And behold, another beast, the second one, resembling a bear, and it was raised up on one side and three ribs were in the mouth between the teeth and thus they said to it arise devour much meat after this I kept looking and behold another one like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird and the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it after this I kept looking in the night vision and behold the fourth beast dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong and its large iron teeth it devoured and crushed the trampled down the remainder with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that, that were before it, and, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up from among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it, and behold, the horn possessed eyes, like the eyes of a man, and the mouth uttering great boasts. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the ancient days took his seat and venture, his vesture was like white snow, and the hair on his head was pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were burning fire. Wow. All right. Now notice that the bear, the lion, and the leopard are stuff that we realize, we know. But the fourth beast is called a beast. And so this is one artist's depiction of it, of what Daniel saw. So, if someone would like to pick up in verse 10. Go for it. <laughs> A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were open. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and his body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, and the extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a, like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before me. And to him was given a dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve it. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And the remaining of the ten horns that were on its head had the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth that had a great boast, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. 
I kept looking, and the Lord that was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of their kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be the fourth kingdom on earth, which will be different from all other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones, and he will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the High One. And he will, in, he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times and time and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion and greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the, uh, the saints of the high one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. At this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. So, that's not a dream, that's a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Now you know why we don't like to do Daniel in Revelation. There you go. Uh, okay. First thing, you know, when we start out, Belshazzar, we have met him before, right? Yep. So, the first conclusion that we have is this is not in chronological order. And now Daniel is having this vision. Okay. <clears throat> Who is the lion? Who is the leopard? Who is the bear? And who is the fourth beast? Which kingdom? The Romans are the lions. Give or take. <laughs> Give or take what? Another country, another. Well. <laughs> I don't know which one would be which one. Are you going to be the same, the same uh, kingdoms from the statue? No. And now, the reason I bring this up is that a lot of people, and if you listen to these guys on TV, you will hear them say, well, the lion is this kingdom, and the leopard is this kingdom, and the bear is obviously the Russians. And you listen to them, and they are trying to fit this revelation into history. Well, it is possible that you can go back to any, almost any point in history and say, well, this obviously meant this, and th this one represented this, but when you get to the fourth one, well, what's that? And the trouble is, these are written in metaphoric terms. They're just saying kingdoms. This is something that will happen. It is not, in this case, this is not saying <coughs> that it's Roman, Babylonian, Medes, and Persians, and that sort of thing. It is. These are kingdoms that will come. And that's all it's saying. But you can make them fit. Uh, that's the trouble. And we'll, we have a, we'll get into that. Um, we'll get into uh, millennialism and what people <laughs> try to do in that. Uh, and the, the trouble is, is that people will read this and instead of reading it as apocryphal, an apocryphal book, they are trying to shoehorn it into current history. I was reading one commentator who will remain nameless, but in Revelation it talks about Israel being plucked out or taken out of Israel. And this commentator, with a straight face, said that was NATO coming to Israel's rescue. And I was going like, yeah, yeah. How did you get that? When, 
go back again. When was Daniel written? Uh, <coughs> 600, 500, 600 BC. Okay. Give or take. Give or take. Yeah. And so, if you're, you're viewing it in Daniel's time, you could make the case that this is the, the, the terrible beast is uh, Rome. Why? Who are the other ones? Are, are they the, the, uh, the Greeks? Are they the Babylonians? Are they the Persians? Ooh, what about, you know, what about the Assyrians? No. They, they seem to got left out. And they were a pretty terrible group of people. And they held, held sway until the Babylonians took over that. So, it is a, an issue with all of these things, you know, trying to say, and then you get the fourth beast, fourth beast, okay? Ten horns, and a third horn has eyes and a mouth and overthrows three others and starts issuing blasphemies against the people of God. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You can make it fit anything. Yeah, you can, it, it, I mean, you said, you know, you could pick, pick an evil empire any time throughout history you can make a, a case for it. And that's sort of my rule. If it doesn't fit into a specific thing, or scripture doesn't say that, like in um, the statue that, um, that uh, Andrew brought up earlier, you know, Daniel said, okay, this one is this kingdom, this one is that kingdom, and this one is this. Okay, I buy into that. But when they say they're not who they are, and we try to do it, it's us trying to interpret scripture versus scripture. Well, future, actually. Huh? Well, I guess for the future. I mean, you know, it's mm -hmm. the ones they're trying to connect with now, with now are, were on this side of the history over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Why is it written in such a way that nobody can understand it? so <laughs> you can apply it. Hey, it, it, it is, it was oh, written to believers, yeah. in this case, Jews. Before who, Christ. Before Christ, who are in exile. Yeah, everything they know, everything they have been told, everything they have been uh, they have believed is, you know, the Holy Land was theirs in perpetuity and they're ripped out of it and carted away. You know, they, they have two big fears. The first one is they'll never return. And the second one is that they will, their bloodlines will be polluted and they'll no longer be the people of God. Because the Assyrians had taken the ten northern tribes and they carted them off and they intermarried with the people that were left behind. And so they became less than true Jews. Those are the modern day what we see in the New Testament as the Samaritans. That's why we look down upon them as a second, uh, second class citizen, if you will. And this is because it is a revelation of future times. That's why it's not specific because what is the goal of this to conquer each other no the, the, the goal is is to to have remember that god is in control and god will prevail in the end that's all it means because what does it say in uh uh, court will sit in, okay, this is the, the you will speak out against the most high, this is that weird horn, but the court will sit in judgment in his dominion, the, the horn's uh, dominion will be taken away, to not, uh, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion and greatness of all the kingdoms of the whole earth will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. God's people. Now, are the Jewish people God's people, or did we destroy them? And uh, all believers in Christ are God's people. Yep. 
that's you know when we when we do the consecration of the elements in you know, every service you know take drink this is the covenant in my blood the new covenant in my blood yeah. so at that point in time forward it is believers in christ <coughs> now if you go back into the old testament you can see uh, some of the Psalms. David, in fact, I think in Psalm 51, says that God doesn't desire sacrifice. The sacrifice to God is a contrite heart. And what happened, in, as we saw in our uh, gospel lesson today, the Pharisees had developed a for lack of a better term, a theology all of their own in keeping these additional laws. Because God, God obviously didn't get it right, so God needed some help. So man instituted 613 additional laws to interpret what God needed then. You only take so many steps a day on the, I, on the Sabbath. You can only do certain things on the Sabbath. You, if you were a true Jew, you had to fix all your meals the day before. That's right. Politics couldn't. in the church. <laughs> yeah. Oh, politics in the church. <laughs> Say it isn't so. <clears throat> but I walked to the temple. <coughs> in, in Beverly Hills, on Saturday, you'll see the park of cars down the street and walk to it. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you a story. When, uh, down in Irvine, I had a meeting with my pastor in our secretary came to the door and said, Hi, there's a rabbi, I forget his last name, here to see you. Uh, do you have him? Sure, bring him in. And after the introductions, he goes, I was wondering if we could use your parking lot. And we said, when? And he said, well, on Saturdays. Yeah, we, we don't have a problem. We told him there were a couple of uh, Saturdays that we had reserved for other things. And he, he was fine with that. And, and I said, so I asked him why. I said, and he goes, well, he said, uh, you guys are probably a lot like us. that I mean, don't have everybody living like they're supposed to be. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. So we all had a chuckle over that. And, um, but, yeah, every Saturday uh, morning, we'll see some cars pull into the, to the lot, and these guys will walk over to the temple. How far away is it? Walk. Oh. I had a job with a very strict Jewish guy, and he could not pay me. He gave it the check to get. God gave him the check to sign, and then he would give it to someone else to give to me because he could not do a transaction with a Gentile. Anybody done here? Have you done this work? Oh yeah, you can do his work. Yeah, you can do his work by him. But he can't have a transaction with. So. <laughs> Let's take a look at. That doesn't make sense. <clears throat> there are some themes that um, uh, you know that uh, go through from vision to vision. In chapter two, we saw the, the statue. Okay. Head of fine gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And then a stone becomes, uh, crushes that and becomes a great mountain. In chapter 7, we see, you know, lion with eagle's wings probably is Babylon. Okay? Bear might be Medo, the Persians. Uh, leopard might be the Greece. Uh, Rome doesn't have a, uh, uh, is, I, I, see, I disagree with this in as much as the incomparable beast with ten horns is not Rome. I don't believe. I believe that is a kingdom that is coming uh, closer to the end of time. But you notice that in the last part of that, God triumphed. That is, the, that is the major theme of four visions in there, is that God's people triumph over evil Satan in the end. It sure doesn't look like it in the middle. No, it doesn't. And, you know, the guys that were 
put to death in, you know, in the, the Jews that were put to death under the Babylonian siege. Yet, uh, roughly, a third died of, of, from war, a third died from pestilence, and a third died from starvation. It's not a fun way to go. No. <clears throat> but in all of these visions, there is a remnant of God's people who remain faithful that are preserved. We saw it in Ezekiel, where people were marked with, uh, were marked as believers with the Tao, which is sort of a T or a cross, depending on you know which uh, of the old ancient ones you, uh, ancient sources you believe in what it's supposed to look like. But the, the essence is, it's a message to God's people that God does prevail in the end. When does the mark of the beast come in? Revelation. But that fits in here where? Um, or does it? It doesn't. Okay. It, it, you know, John's revelation has some parallels. Um, if, if you're going to say there is a a parallel uh, thing to that, that would be more in the Ezekiel. And remember, Ezekiel is roughly the same time as this, <coughs> as is Jeremiah. So, let's talk about dispensationalism or premillennial dispensationalism. Anybody heard that? Those yes. terms? Yeah. Nobody knows what it is. Okay. You ever heard of the rapture? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, all right. What they try to do is they try to take and put um, certain chunks of time and then, uh, first of all, let me say, caveat, this is highly simplified. There are variations on this. But there are six uh, dispensations or periods of time. One is the secret return of Christ. And there's where the resurrection of the just and the rapture are caught up with Christ and taken to heaven. Trouble with that interpretation is there's no scriptural backing to it. Where do they get it? They, they, if they take a look at it and say, well, obviously this is what it means when it doesn't say that. Yeah. Yeah, it's like saying that the bear in the vision that we just read about is the Russians. Well, I can't say that. <laughs> He and I were driving in South Dakota years ago. On a Sunday morning, we were going to visit my niece. Yeah. And there was not a person we saw, no tractors moving, nothing done. And for I said, miles. For miles. And I said, Did the rapture come when you missed it? <laughs> <laughs> you got that. You got that. <laughs> you, you might be worried if that's the case. <laughs> it was just funny because there was no movement of anything, any place. Okay. Now, we have the secret return that's not supported. Then we have a seven-year tribulation. And remember, the seven-year is, seven is a number of perfection. And where the Antichrist reigns and the persecution occurs. And aren't they giving like a second chance to get in? Yeah. And that's like, well, wait a minute. There is no second chance yeah. because we just read in our gospel lesson today you know, when the cornerstone, if you stumble on it, you're going to, it's going to break you. And if it falls upon you in judgment, it's going to kill you. Where's the second chance? And, and, that, and I can't tell you where it was in the Bible where the, the man went to hell and then he, he wanted to tell his brothers or oh, tell yeah. his friends and yeah. they said, oh. he said no. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you had your chance, so. Well, yeah. it, it was not only that, but, you know, <clears throat> 
his brothers had the prophets and they had the witness of the current day. Mm -hmm. And these guys still did not accept Christ as the Messiah. Um, that's why uh, um, in building up the church of Christ, uh, God uses signs and miracles. Are there still miracles today? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Yeah. However, we get real loose with the term miracle. Um, my daughter insists um, that the birth of her son was a miracle. They had trouble getting pregnant. Well, no. I mean, it's you know, it's a, a, a tremendous blessing, but it's not a miracle. Took us nine years, it must have been a miracle then for us. Eight years. How long was it? Eight years. I have a girl, follow us. Twelve. Yeah. <laughs> so so we get this tribulation. And then a second visible return of Christ, followed by you know, the sheep and the goats. Then Christ reigns for a thousand years on earth. And so, and the next one has a real problem because resurrection of the just. Wait a minute. If that's the case, our creed's absolutely wrong. Yeah, because now everybody knows. Well, I mean, you know, if, first of all, and we'll, and we'll talk about this in the revelation piece uh, of it. What happens when you die? You go to heaven. Your soul goes to heaven. Soul goes to heaven. Soul goes to heaven. Soul is judged. Yes. And if you're not a believer. So is that what no. judgment is totally based on, whether you're a believer or a non-believer? Mm -hmm. It's faith. Because you're forgiven for everything you did. Right. Is that being done right as soon as you die? And it uh, changes you go to hell or you go to heaven? Or does it wait? You are judged right then and there. Right there. Yeah. And the what happens is the soul goes to paradise, is with Christ under the throne, waiting for the time that the second coming will will occur. The bodies will be resurrected, perfected, and the soul will be reunited. And then you'll have the new heavens and the new earth. So there's not a second judgment, which is sometimes yeah. mentioned. Right. There's only one. Yeah. But I don't want them reading the book on me and what all the things I've done wrong mm -hmm. on my judgment day. I don't want to either go or no. But that's the point. Your, what you, your bad things uh, have been forgiven. It's you're, just whether or not you Yeah, but they're read to the people. Oh, they're read to the people? Oh, there's not enough time. I mean, not <laughs> <laughs> but no, is, you know, that your judgment occurs right then and there. Right then and there. When your soul floats off, you're judged. How can the good Lord read all those who all have souls in Well, he already knows. For God, he already knows, and he already knows everything you did, everything you've done in your life, he knows. And what, what, what freaks people out, okay, notice that most crimes are committed at night. Yeah. And that's sort of a very primordial way of trying to hide your sins. Well, guess who's sitting there with you when you're sitting? God. Yeah. yeah. He knows. He knows but, your heart. But what the great thing is, is that for a believer, their sins are removed from them as far as the east is from the west. God chooses to remember those sins no more. Ooh. Yeah, sign me up. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want my sins remembered. Because if he remembers them, 
I'm in trouble. Yeah, baby. And then, you know, um, the resurrection of the unjust. I can't find any scriptural thing that says that this is something that, you know, you can even remotely come up with. I've never even heard of white throne judgment. Yeah, it, uh, we'll get into that. It's some of these dispensationalists. Um, the guys like uh, Hal Lindsey and Tim, what's his name, LaHaye? Oh, LaHaye, yeah. 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 He, yeah. <clears throat> well, the trouble is he sort of got that inverted. The guys that, if you, if you take his reading like it's supposed to be, the guys who are taken in the rapture are the believers. Yeah. The guys left behind are like, <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's the, the second... The second chance, the second judgment, if you will, is um, really the man trying to impose themselves on God. Why does everybody should have a second chance? Well, guess what? You've had your first chance. You've had your second, third, fourth. Numerous first. chances. Your whole life. And, yeah. Where does it say anything about a second chance? It's just, it just, just the way they read it. Oh. Yeah. It's... Um, what does the resurrection of the unjust mean? <laughs> okay. Is that the second? That would be the sheep and the goats. Okay. But if you if you read it, you know, there's everybody sitting there and he separates the, the believers and non-believers. That's like, oh well, wait a minute. Well, you don't want to be a goat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you have you you have this this separation, you know, the good and the bad. But it's only one time. You know, those are the, the ones that are living at the time of the return. You know, the ones that have died, you know, um, in their sins, in, in unbelief, will be reunited with their body, but it will be in the, in the dark place. The regions. Yeah. And, you know, that's what, why you get these guys, they're trying to... Yeah, try, trying to uh, pacify might be uh, might be a way to do it. I'm, I'm thinking more. Of, they they want to give this one last chance, sort of like a Lazarus in hell yeah. mm -hmm. um, versus um, you know saying, hey, you know, okay, it's gone for you know, time's over for me, but what about my brothers? And you know and the parables or the uh, story says that, hey, you, you've got the prophets, you've got Jesus, you know, what more do you need? Well, if, you know, somebody came back from the dead. Oh, let's see, who did came back from the dead? Uh, oh, yeah, Jesus. And, we, and people don't believe that. Well, Christ revived the couple. Yeah. He did it. Yeah. yeah. Well, who made Lazarus? <laughs> Not the same Lazarus, but yeah. different Lazarus. Yeah. And then we have the new heavens and new earth. Yeah. What that entails, we have no idea. Well, if you're Mormon, you get a new planet. <clears throat> yes, that's true. Not, not a new one. You get your own planet. Yeah, you get your own planet. <laughs> but oh, I've never been able to figure out if, if the father now is a good Mormon, he gets his own planet. With his family, then the son is a good Mormon, he gets his own planet with the planet too. With his family too? Yeah. How does that work? Well, it's not, not one family gathering. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you got people like it's Carl Sagan going, yeah, you're on the planet. Planet. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I have, I've done one study on Mormon theology and it's just hard to, uh, to wrap your head around it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but they are definitely works righteousness. Yes. And it's like, you know, that, you know. And they got great youth program. They really do. They, uh, uh, hey, their outreach to families is very attractive. Don't, uh, I won't kid you. You know, if you could combine true Christianity like 
church I came to, uh, came from in Irvine, they've got a elementary group, and I think it's, uh, I want to say they have, they have two actually, it's first to third, fourth to sixth, they have a junior high group, they have a high school group, uh, they're working on a young adult group, um, Jim has taken that congregation to from 40 a week to probably 200, hmm. 180, 200 a week. And the, what's interesting is the kids are bringing their friends. Oh, you got to come to our youth group. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Now, the church Chris joined over in Tennessee. There's a great youth program as far as we understand that they're doing. And you think about that, and it's got to start with the youth. Sure. <clears throat> you have to. You're not going to get the adults to go up there or whatever involved in the youth. Mm -mm. Yeah, and, th and that's one of the things that is really, uh, you get, you do two things by focusing on the youth. You get them involved. Traditionally, after confirmation is where we have fallen a flat on our face and we don't like, what do we do with him? Okay, you're done. Mm -hmm. And no, it's not, it's not, it's a continual process. Um, and what normally happens in most congregations is that after confirmation, you know, just be quiet and sit down. And we, we expect you to be an adult at that point. And that's not fair to the kids, it's not fair to, to the church at large because you need, you need them in the word and they're gonna have a different set of issues to work with than, let's say. <laughs> they're still kids. That, and and yeah, we've not realized that until the last few years. Yeah, there have been some guys that have done that. Some of the best pastors I know are, are former DCEs because they know that the kids are a foundation. Like I said, they're um, at in Irvine. The last three years, uh, we have had last four years: 17, 17, 19, and 19, 18 kids in confirmation class. Uh, Confirmed. We don't have that many kids in uh, in the congregation, <coughs> but and they're bringing families. <coughs> well, hey, I, I, I want to go to church. I want to go to this church. Mm -hmm. And then you know, Jim has. Uh, I'd say of those, a third of them are being baptized because they have never been baptized. Some of them are coming from Mariners, which is just up the street. You know, um, Jim is going to have a, a serious decision to make of whether to bring on another pastor, not too distant future for that. Because he's getting to the point where he can't do it all. Interesting. The great white throne judgment is described in Revelation. Chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, and is the final judgment prior to being cast into the lake of fire. We know from Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 15, that this judgment will take place after the millennium and after Satan is thrown into the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet are. Revelation chapter 19, yada yada yada. The books are open, <coughs> contain records of other things, whether they are good or evil, because God knows everything that has been said, done, and even thought. And He will reward and punish each according to 
Psalm 28, Romans 2, and Revelation 2. Okay. It's good to be pumpkin time. Okay. That's, well, we'll be covering that in, you know, Revelation. What was the question you asked? White throne judgment. White throne judgment. Uh, 